You were not meant to be a slave to the grind. You were not meant to trade your life force for money. You can escape gravity. You can unlock your life. You got this. Let's go. Welcome to Unlock Your Life. This is your host, Jennings Smith. Guys, I've got a super exciting episode for you today. If you read the title, How Do I Raise My First Million? How to Raise Your First Million, Step by Step. We're also going to talk about why you want to raise your first million and what that can do for you, what doors that can unlock, how that can help you progress. So let's get right into it. First of all, why do I need to raise a million dollars? Why would I even want to do that? Number one reason is scale. You legitimately and literally cannot scale your real estate portfolio or business portfolio or whatever you're doing, because this applies to buying businesses. This can apply to hard money lending. This can apply to investing in your own real estate. This can apply to syndications and raising money for apartment deals. Money translates into a lot of different things because everybody needs money. So why do you want to do that? You got to be able to scale. Let's say you have zero dollars, right? Then it's obvious. You got to get other people's money to be able to buy anything. Let's say you have $300,000 and you want to go out there and buy a million dollar apartment complex. Cool. You got the down payment. Maybe you can qualify for the loan. You've got in your first deal. Now what? The next deal comes along. It's good. It's great. It's phenomenal but you can't do anything with it because you don't have another down payment. You put your $300,000 into this million dollar deal and it's going to be at least 18 to 36 months before you can stabilize, refinance that cash out, or maybe you have to sell that to pull the cash back out to go do another deal. Either way, you are not really growing at scale. Secondly, you want to help other people get involved in what you're doing. The larger your network becomes and the more advantageous and helpful you are to other people, the more they're going to reciprocate. You help others get paid, they're going to help you get paid. So if you have the expertise, right, let's say you're in this world and you have deal flow and you know how to analyze this stuff, but you know, you're running out of money. And so if you help them plug into that, right, they can lean on your expertise. They can utilize their capital to make good returns, you know, 10%, 12%, 15%, 20%. 100%. It kind of depends on the deal, but you can help them to make money. And if you're helping them get what they want, they're going to help you get what you want. In providing value to others, leading first with that equation is only going to expand your life. This was something that I was really nervous about, scared about. I wanted to protect my ego. I didn't want to feel like I was needy or I was asking people or begging people for money. And so for a long time, I was intimidated by capital raising. You may be intimidated by capital raising. You may think, Jennings, you know, obviously I know that if I had a million dollars at my disposal, I could make money with that. But I don't want to go out there and ask for it. I don't want to be seen as needy. I don't want to be seen as desperate. And when you kind of get over yourself there and you recognize if you have these skills, it's actually selfish. It's selfish for you to keep this stuff to yourself and not be willing to help other people participate. And because you're just trying to protect your own fragile ego. And it's completely wrong. We're going to kind of get into the, the psychology of raising money and how you need to approach these meetings and overcome some of these things. But whatever you're struggling with, I would write that down, right? Because if you write that down and you quantify, this is something that's holding me back. And maybe it's more than one thing. But maybe what's holding you back is, I don't really have relationships with people that I trust to give money to. That's a very, very valid point, right? You don't want to give your money to some scam artist or somebody that's incompetent, doesn't know what they're doing, and they're going to lose your investor's money. Maybe you're not competent enough. They're like, I don't really understand these deals very well to raise capital for that. And so I just am I'm stuck. I see that. If somebody comes to me and wants me to raise money for uh, you know, a real complicated business or something that I don't really understand or something that I know is high risk, like let's just say cryptocurrency or something, I'm not raising money for that deal because I don't have the core competency in that field to be able to protect not only myself, but my investors first and foremost. So maybe it's an ego thing. It's like, it just feels weird. I don't want to put myself out there. What if it doesn't work? What if I tell everybody that this is what I'm doing and then I flake out and I give up on it and then I look stupid. I don't want to do that. It just kind of depends on 
what is this thing that is holding you back? What emotion is that that feeling generating? And then is there a way to solve that? Right. So if you don't have the relationships, well, okay, how could I make those relationships? How could I connect with different groups that are doing deals that I trust, that have a great track record, that if I put money with them, I know they're going to execute. If I don't know what I'm doing and I really, really want to know this field, right? So I don't really, really want to know the plumbing company field. So why am I going to spend two years learning about plumbing companies and how they work and how they're valued and and all the ins and outs of plumbing companies so I can raise money for that? I don't want to know about that. But if you do want to know about real estate or apartment complexes or self-storage or whatever it is that's going to become your field of expertise, well, okay, is there education on that? Is there mentoring groups? Is there someone I know that's in the industry that's already doing this that could show me the ropes, right? Are there program? I mean, obviously we have the deal room, which is only focused on educating, protecting, mitigating risk, connecting you with our other operators. It's a deal incubator for this world. But where are those programs that are in the field that I want to get into? How can I overcome this objection in my own mind, which is valid? If you don't know what you're doing, and you don't know how to accurately assess the risk of a deal, you should not be raising capital for that deal. You should not be going out and taking your grandma and your aunt and your uncle's money and giving it to some shyster and have him lose it or blow it. Like you got to know the fundamentals of how these deals are underwritten. If you want, I'll send you my underwriting spreadsheet. I'll send you eight videos on how to underwrite a multifamily deal free of charge. Just shoot me a DM on Facebook or Instagram, whatever. I'll send it right over to you. No charge. My gift to you for being a listener. But you got to know how to do that and writing down these things and then how can I overcome them? And if it's something like simple, well, somewhat simple of it just feels weird, I think you got to identify, well, why does that feel weird? What am I thinking I'm projecting? And is that the truth? Am I really begging for money? There's more money out there than there's deals. In fact, a vetted, qualified operator coupled with somebody who is mitigating the risk and understanding the deal, connecting that to money, it's actually a very, very valuable piece. Wouldn't you have liked to know about Twitter as it was coming online or Amazon or any of these large companies that you hear about celebrities investing in in their infancy and they turned you know, $10,000 into $10 million. Like those people that connected the investors to those deals, they're pretty cool. They're pretty valuable. They're pretty thanked and well-beloved by the investor who got connected into that deal, right? And so when you start to change your dynamic and change your mindset around, wait a minute, I am opening up a whole nother world to my investor base that they would not have had access to without me and I'm helping them, it starts to shift the way you talk, the way you present yourself, the way you walk into those conversations, and you start to see the value that you're bringing. Okay, another way, let's talk about nuts and bolts of the why. Capital raising can be a very, very lucrative business. You know, if you are able to bring capital to somebody's deal, that is a linchpin piece, something that they desperately need And the deal is not going to close without that. And so you can get compensated. So how do you get compensated? There's a couple different ways, right? Number one, you can get compensated by a capital raise fee. A lot of times capital raisers will get two, three, four, five percent, sometimes even more of the capital they raise. Meaning if you raise a million dollars, you're getting a success fee of 30 to 50 to a hundred thousand dollars at closing for getting them the money. Another way you can be compensated is you can participate in the acquisition fee of a property. So let's say a $4 million property is getting purchased and there's a 3% acquisition fee. Well, that's $120,000 that's going to get paid to the GP side at closing. If you are part of the capital raise and you're part of the GP equity, you are going to get a piece of that $120,000. Maybe it's, you know, 10%, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 50%. I don't, I don't know. It depends on what you negotiate with them. Another way is equity in the deal. If you're doing something for like, we're going to buy this apartment complex and I'm going to get a piece of the acquisition fee, but I'm also going to get a piece of the equity. I want 10% of the equity, or I want 20% of the equity, or I want 5% of the equity. It depends on, you know, what's fair and, and what makes sense to the deal. But as that deal starts to cash flow, 10% of the cash flows are flowing to you. As that deal refinances and there's cash out refi proceeds, 10% of that goes to you. 
as that deal eventually sells and, and hopefully turns a profit, 10% of that profit is going to you. And so some of it is getting paid upfront at the actual work. Some of it's getting paid along the way. Some of it's getting paid at the end, maybe two, three, four, five years down the road. I've done deals where I've deferred a lot of my stuff to the end event. So I'll talk about a deal. There was a 280 unit that needed a million dollars raised by me. And what we negotiated was essentially I would get $50,000 up front for raising the money, which was a 5%, you know, capital raise fee. And I would also get $50,000 at the liquidity event, whether that would be a refinance or a sale, I'd get another $50,000. I had to defer that for 18 to 24 months. So what I did was I took my 50,000 that I got paid initially. I invested that into the deal myself as an LP, right? To show good faith with the other investors. Hey, I'm in the deal with you. And that generates, you know, a return on that money. So I get that back. Plus I get my success fee at the end. Now I did that because I didn't need the $50,000 at the time. So I just rolled it into the investment. If you need it now, take it now. But these are ways that you can get in there. Another thing that people really discount is more opportunity. Imagine you're on Facebook and you're trying to, you know, put together a deal, you've been underwriting deals, you've been making offers and you see somebody who's putting up their hand saying, "I have a million dollars to invest. I have 500 grand that I can raise. I'm looking for opportunities and I have cash to deploy." Does that guy sound like an attractive opportunity? Do you want to reach out to him? Do you want to tell him about the phenomenal deal that you have under contract? That's awesome. Heck yeah, you do. And the person who's making that post, who has the money or the ability to raise the money, he is looking at your opportunity and probably dozens and dozens of other ones. Some of them are crap. Some of them are good. Some of them are great. And he's picking out which ones that he wants to be involved in who he wants to build relationships with, and who he wants to help. And so as you do this, you put yourself as a very valuable member of anyone's team, and you are going to get more opportunity flowing to you. If you're the money man or the money woman, you are going to get first looks at stuff that other people aren't seeing. So for example, this was back early in my career. A group came to me, they had a mobile home park under contract for $185,000. They said, Jennings, we need $200,000. We need $200,000, we need 185 to buy it, we need like 15 grand to fix up the gravel roads. And we're gonna put 160,000 into moving new homes into the park to fill it up, but this is gonna be a good deal. And I'm looking at it, it's like 36 pads, it's half empty, so distressed, they couldn't get a loan, that's why they needed the cash. And they don't have the ability to raise it. They have 160, but they don't have 360. They needed another 200. So they come to me and I say, yeah, I can get you the 200,000, but it's going to cost you 9% interest. That's going to be paid quarterly. And I want 50% of the deal. So they're looking at the deal and they're thinking, well, without Jennings, there is no deal. We can make money on this deal. Let's do it. They said, let's do it. Okay, cool. I took that deal. I then went to my investor base. I pitched it to a couple of them. I said, look, we'll pay you 9% current on the money and we'll give you 20% equity in the deal. And one of the investors said, yep, I'll do it. I'll fund the 200 grand. So he funds the 200 grand. As they pay their 9% payment every quarter, that funnels directly to the investor. So he's making at least 9% now. And what they did was they did. They filled it up. They stabilized it. And 18 months later, they ended up selling it for 750 grand. So it was a great deal. They they made about you know 350 to 400 thousand dollars, of which I got 50 percent. Now of that 50 percent, I had to give 20 percent to him, but I kept 30 percent. So it was an awesome deal for me. It put you know 100 plus thousand dollars into my pocket in 18 months without you know having the 200 grand. At the time, I didn't have the 200 grand but I knew someone that did and I had been digging my well. And that's what we're going to talk about soon here is the tactics and techniques to get this piece rolling and get you started. But I'm just trying to paint the vision of how powerful it is to be the guy or the girl with money, to be the person that can help other people achieve their goals so that they can flip that house. They can sell that property. They can stabilize it. They can raise the money and they can buy their apartment complex. Another thing that you know I do 
have done is owner financed mortgages where I'll go out and buy a house for $30,000 cash. I'll put a for sale sign and put it on Facebook. I'll say owner finance, I'll finance your mortgage. I'll give you a 30 year mortgage. You put down three grand or five grand and your payment is going to be basically what rent would be or less. That's very attractive. Those houses move fast and I'm selling them for double what I paid, $60,000. And so the person looking at it, you know, they're looking at like, well, wait a minute, maybe this house isn't really worth 60,000 and it's not. It's not worth 60,000 cash, but they don't have 60,000 cash and they're literally burning $900 a month in rent with building no equity. And so now they say, okay, Jennings will finance me. He'll loan me the money. Yes, it's at 12% interest. And yes, you know, it's for more than probably the house would sell on cash. But if I pay this house off and maybe I pay it off early, maybe I increase my payments, paid off in 10 years or 15 years instead of 30 years, whatever, either way, I'm going to be ahead of if I had just rented, right? And so they're seeing that as an opportunity to own their own home. And I'm utilizing the money to do this. Now, in this case, I have my own cash and I'm just buying them. But if I didn't, well, I could go to an investor and say, hey, I've got a single family house. I want you to loan me $30,000. I will pay you back over five years at 10% interest or 12% interest. You're going to have a first position mortgage on this house so that if I default on the loan, you've got a security instrument of this house. It's worth at least 30 grand. We've also got someone who's bought it from me for $60,000. So really you're kind of into it for 50% LTV. And after five years, their payment basically at double the price and 12% interest is the same as paying the guy off in five years, right? So if they're paying you $700, it's going to funnel directly to him and he's going to get all the cash for the first five years. But now you own that house free and clear with no debt on it. And they still owe, you know, $50,000 on it or whatever, depending on, on the AM schedule. And so that's a cool way to do this if you can raise the $30,000, if you don't have the $30,000 yourself. And to get an investor to buy into that is really not too hard. I know this may seem difficult, especially if you have never done it, but if you offer somebody a first position mortgage, 12% interest, you know, backed by real estate, maybe you've already got it, an owner in place at 60,000. I mean, they're going to see that as, This is a pretty sure thing. And if that person defaults, well, you can sell it again and you can collect another three to five grand down and do it all over, make up your payments to the lender. So that's one way. Another hard money loan way I've done it is I've done first position mortgages on houses. A guy needed a down payment for a apartment complex. So I wanted to help him get his deal closed and get his dream accomplished. And he owned a house free and clear. The house was worth, you know, $300,000. He only needed 150. I said, I'll loan it. I'll loan the 150 against the free and clear house. And you can take that money and go buy your apartment complex. But, you know, if he does not pay, well, boom, I can repossess that house and sell that house off and and recoup my 150,000 at least. And he's very incentivized to not fail because the house is worth 300 grand. I mean, worst case scenario, he'll go fire sale the house for 250, pay me off and put $100,000 in his pocket. Doing another loan on some land. Uh, it's 18 acres. Uh, I got it appraised at 950,000. They needed 350, so my leverage is low. I'm willing to do that in a you know on a 12 month term, and they're doing that deal. We're executing that in the next week or two. So I'm just saying, you know what? One more example, guys. Sorry, I get excited about this stuff. Got a guy. They're starting up a business. This is an insane podcast business. They're going to be scaling podcasts. They've they've already done it with their music portfolio by running ads, driving traffic, and then collecting ad revenue on the listens and downloads. So it's, you know, YouTube and Amazon music and Spotify and all that stuff. And so they're going to do the same thing with a podcast platform, driving listeners and viewers to these podcasts so that they'll download the podcast, listen to the ads, and they'll get paid. So I'm looking at this and they're like, hey, we, we want you to invest in this company. And we want half a million dollars. And I'm looking at it, I'm I'm thinking, well, if I went out to my investor base to raise this, I might, might be able to get it done. Like I could put together a deck and I could convince everybody that this is a phenomenal business and it's a moonshot and it's going to just make a hundred million dollars and it's going to be awesome. However, that is not my core competency, right? What do I know about 
podcast scaling. What do I know about running ads and getting paid through Spotify and Amazon and artificial intelligence and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know anything about that. And so there, if I don't know what I'm talking about, it's really easy for somebody to deceive me, right? Maybe knowingly, maybe unknowingly, but I'm not going to be able to accurately assess the risks of that company. And so, you know, it may, it may fail. And if it fails, boom, I just lost my investors 500 grand. That isn't good. That isn't good for me. That isn't good for them. That burns a whole lot of goodwill. And the way I'm wired, I'm going to have to figure out a way to pay them back. I don't want that. So in listening to them, I'm like, guys, this is a great business. It's a cool idea. I love it. I can't do it. Do you have anything that you could collateralize? Do you have anything that I could put my hands on that I understand that would make me feel better about this 500 grand? Well, yes, actually we do. We have a music studio in Nashville. It's phenomenal. Uh, It's in the best part of Nashville. It's a recording artist studio. And, you know, we bought it for, well, I'm not going to get into the specific numbers, but they have, you know, one and a half to $2 million in equity in this property. And they're looking for 500 grand. This is something that I can sink my teeth into where it's like, okay, I can get an appraisal on this. I can prove the value of that. I can be all in for 70% LTV or less. If they default, we've got a pre-signed quick claim deed where I immediately take possession of the property. I can fire sale it, get our capital back. So that I can explain to my investors. And on top of that, I can make a capital success fee of 3%, right? There's 500 grand times 3%. That's $15,000. I'm going to make a 1% origination fee on the loan that I'm going to keep. There's another five grand. If they go longer than nine months and they need to extend for another three months, I get another 1%. There's another five grand. That's 25 grand. And I'm just passing on the 17% interest rate directly to the investors. So they're getting a good return in a uh, you know risk mitigated fashion, right? We're all into this for two and a half million, whereas the property's worth three and a half million. So I like my chances if something really, really goes down that we're going to be able to recoup that $500,000. But here's where the deal gets really cool is like, not only do I make some fees up front, I'm also getting an equity stake in the podcast company, right? So now if that podcast company fizzles out and doesn't work, well, that's too bad. They still owe the 500 grand and we have a collateral against it. If the podcast company does work, right? I mean, if they scale it the same way they scale their music portfolio and they already have proof of concept and they've already started doing this, well, this company could generate a couple million dollars in revenue or not in revenue, in net profits per year, right? So $3 million first year, $7 million second year, more and more and more. And you know what? Performers are only worth the paper they're written on. However, let's just say they do hit $3 million in net profits within a year or two. Well, my equity stake in that is small, but it's still worth six figures, right? Six figures a year in royalty income off of doing that one deal one time. Okay. So this is the things I'm telling you about You're probably thinking, Jennings, okay, just get into the tactics. But I want you to understand how important this piece can be, how valuable it can be to put that in your arsenal of who you are and the skills you have. So let's get into how to do it. First and foremost, we already hit on this a little bit, but pre-qualifications. And I'm talking about your pre-qualifications. If you don't know what you're doing, you should not be doing this. Okay? So... Let's say you own some single family homes, some rentals, et cetera, or you've done some fix and flips. That's something that you understand, right? You could raise private money to fund a fix and flip. You could raise private money to do, you know, the the 30-year mortgage thing I was talking about earlier, right? If you don't know how to do apartments, you really shouldn't be raising money for apartments. So, I mean, first step is to qualify yourself, get educated, get mentors, get in the room with qualified operators so that you aren't getting the money into a bad deal because that's hard to overcome. You know, it's really, really difficult. When you start losing people money, it is going to be hard to come back from that. Another pre-qualification is your ethics, your morals, right? Your background, your backstory. I'm I'm pretty much talking to people that they do what they say they're going to do. They have a good name in their community. People can trust their word. And 
they're a morally upright and upstanding person. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure people that aren't that can still probably raise money, but they shouldn't. So those are the pre-qualifications is you've got to have competency and you've got to have that moral fiber of doing the right thing for your investors no matter what. And no matter what happens, you are going to do everything in your power to make them whole. And if you don't have that, hit me up. Like I said, I can send you a free underwriting course on how to start this. If you're interested in the deal room, we can talk about that. It's $400 a month. So not crazy expensive to get training on how to do this and also get connected to people that are doing this. So if you got the pre-qualifications, let's say, okay, Jennings, look, I've done this stuff. Like I already own my own little apartment. I've got maybe five, six rentals. I'm in this world. I know what I'm doing. I feel competent. I feel trained. I've been in the deal room for a while. I, I understand this stuff. Show me some tactics. Okay. Where I started and where, you know, could be a good place for you to start is with this. If you're listening, I'm holding up my cell phone right here. This is where I started. I went into my contacts, right? We all have probably a couple hundred contacts, maybe even a thousand contacts in your phone of people that you've saved their number. And you open up a little Excel file and you just say like possible investors. And as you scroll through your thing, you're like, oh no, okay. Yeah, this is my broke uncle. This person is, you know, a teacher, nothing against teachers, but they probably don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around. Wait a second. This guy owns an HVAC company. Okay. This guy, he's a doctor. This guy, he's a dentist. This dude, he's interested in real estate, but he's never really bought anything for himself, but he has good income, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to find people that, that probably fit your avatar. And your avatar is somebody that has at least 50 grand laying around that they want to invest, that they could invest, investable assets. There's no sense in spending hours of time on the phone with people that don't have any money. Also, as you progress into this, bigger is better. You know, like if somebody is giving you their last $50,000, that's probably not a great investor. One, because they're going to be really, really focused on that money and they're going to want that deal to be executed perfectly. And if anything goes a little bit sideways, are they going to be understanding? Or is it like, dude, that was my last $50,000. That's all I had for like my retirement. Like that's not the best avatar. And also they can't invest again. Even if they do invest $50,000, they're now broke. They don't have anything else to invest. You want to go to people that are constantly replenishing their well. You know, they're making multiple six figures a year and they can invest in multiple deals with you. And they're also going to be patient because not every deal goes perfectly, right? We're going to refinance this out in 18 months, but it took 24 months. Well, are they going to give you hell over those six months that that you were late in refinancing it? Or our plan was to sell this in three years and we ended up selling it in four years. Are they going to be happy because they made return? They got their money back, but it took an extra year. Are they going to be complaining and making your life miserable for that last year? Because you didn't sell it in three years. You said you're going to do it in three years and you took four years. Okay. These are the things that you want to think about as you're making this list, but going through that list and just writing down possibilities. Okay. And then you don't have to be too strict. Just write it down. Another lead source that you already have is your email list right? Going through your email list. Who are your contacts? Who are the people that you have saved in your contacts? Who are the people that have been emailing you that you have been emailing? Would they be able to make it onto this Excel document? Next thing I did was I went through my social media accounts, like my Facebook. I think I had a thousand friends on Facebook. And so I'm like looking through the Facebook and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, this guy, he was my fraternity brother. And now he's an engineer and he's doing really, really well. This guy I grew up with him and he's an attorney now and he, he's making good money. This guy became a doctor or this person is in, you know, my parenting mastermind with me and he owns a, a dog food company or whatever it is, they might be interested. And going through the social media to just put them on the list, put them on the list. Okay, so let's just say you took a few hours over the next week to do this. And right there, that's where most people are going to stop. They're like, oh, I'm not doing that. That's too hard. Like, that's too hard to scroll through my phone. That's too hard to go through my email. And that's too hard to go through my Facebook and try to compile a list of 50 to 100 people. I'm not doing that. Okay. That is why 95% of people don't do anything. Because they're not willing to buckle down and actually do the action items that are going to move the needle. I'm telling you, this is what I did. 
This is what I did to build an $80 million real estate portfolio. It works. Just follow the steps and start to take action. Okay, so let's say you got your list. Let's say you made it past step one. All right, now what do you do? Well, if you got their email address, you shoot them an email. If you got their phone number, you shoot them a text. If you got your, them on social, you send them an Instagram or Facebook message. And this is what you say. Hey, I have started to purchase multifamily real estate, or I've started to raise capital for hard money loans or whatever you're doing. You know, we're uncovering a lot of good opportunities. We're generating 12 to 15 to 18% returns. I wouldn't go above 20 because that makes people think it's way too risky, but 12, 15, 18% returns. These deals are pretty big. So the minimum is about $50,000. Do you know anybody who possibly would be interested in something like this? Right? You didn't ask them directly. You're asking them, do you know anybody? So they're either going to say, no, I don't know anybody. And that's it. That's a dead end. They might say, yeah, I know somebody. Or they might say, I don't really know anybody, but maybe I'd be interested in that. What are you thinking? And they're opening that door to further that conversation. Or they might never reply at all. And you know what? Who cares, right? It doesn't matter. That's where, oh, well, what if they just ignore me? What if they reject me? What if they, they want to have a call with me and then I don't know what to say? All this stuff, these imaginary horribles that haven't happened, you're already starting to think about those and this is why you're stuck. Okay, so... Sending out that message. Hey, this is what I'm working on. These are the kind of returns that they generate. I don't have anything right now. These are large deals. You know, you need to tell them it's going to be like 50 to 100 grand. You don't want to get on the phone with somebody that has five grand. Okay. You want to get on the phone with somebody that has 50 to 100 to $500,000 or more. Do you know anyone that'd be interested in this? And if they know somebody, connect with them. If they don't know anybody, but they're interested, connect with them. Okay. Then that leads me to, now you've distilled your list down. Okay, so you started with 100 people. Maybe you only got 20 responses. Maybe you only got 10. Maybe you only got five. Doesn't matter. You got something. And this is the start. Okay, so you get on the phone with them. First conversation, even if you have the biggest, most slam dunk deal in the world, you're not talking about that deal. I want to repeat that. Even if you have a deal in your pocket that needs to close next week and you need 500 grand right now, you don't mention it. Now we're talking more about posturing. Now we're talking a little bit more about psychology. We're also talking about the legal aspects of this stuff because when you're raising money, if you have a 506B, you can only ask friends and family, people you have a prior relationship with. And you do have a prior relationship with these people, but you can't generally solicit unless your deal is a 506C. I'm not going to get into the weeds but there are some legal ramifications between blasting out like, I've got a deal, give me money. And it's not set up correctly with the SEC. That can be illegal. Okay. So if it's a friends and family deal, it's fine. If it's someone you have a personal relationship with, it's fine. But as you generate the interest, let's say, okay, cool. Let's get on the phone. Or if they're local, let's go have, grab a coffee and we'll talk. You walk into that meeting and you have to have a plan. Okay. I would recommend that you have a sample pitch, right? A little sample, like one pager, which kind of gives the synopsis of a fake deal. Or maybe this is a deal you've already did, or maybe this is like what a deal could look like, but you have a little sample pitch, okay? If you need a sample pitch, I probably have one I can send you, okay? Just message me. I'll give, I'll give you one if you don't have a sample pitch. Okay, so you go into the meeting and you talk to them. You don't whip out your, your pitch sheet and start blabbering on about all these returns you're going to make because they don't care yet. What you do is you talk to them, hey, what's going on? How have you been? How's the kids? How's the friends and family? You know, you, you, you let them talk and you start to build that relationship because with this sort of business, you got to recognize they don't know your field like you know your field. They are going to just basically be transferring the trust to you. They say, well, you know what? I know Jennings. Jennings is a pretty good guy. He's pretty sharp in real estate. I know he's been in real estate a while. And if he thinks it's a good deal, then it's probably the good deal. That's where you need to get to first. Okay. So you start to build that relationship talking, and then you can move the conversation to real estate. You don't want to go too far on the, on the personal stuff because it just seems a little disingenuous. They know that you're meeting with them for a purpose. I wouldn't camp on that for too long. 
but you want to move it into, okay, so what do you like about multifamily? What's attracting you to hard money lending? What are you investing your money in right now? What do you not like about that? Like maybe they're like, hi, I got this money tied up in my IRA and it's making me 6%. I put some money into an annuity five years ago and it never has done much. Or I've got a lot in the stock market. I've made a ton of money in the stock market, but I feel like the stock market is getting really hot and I kind of want to diversify. Whatever it is, now you're gathering information and you want to camp out for a long time on that. What do they like about real estate? Oh, I like that it's tangible. I like that it's a real asset. If it's a lending thing, I like that we could foreclose and take the asset and, and recoup the money if, if we had to. I see rents going up and I know rents are going to keep going up. I see inflation. You know what I've heard about the tax benefits of investing in real estate? And I really, I'm paying a lot in taxes. I'd like to avoid some of that. Whatever their motivation is, you got to start to uncover that and let them talk themselves into the asset class. People trust themselves. They don't trust you necessarily. And even if they do trust you, they trust themselves more than they trust you. So the more that they're talking and the more they're reinforcing why they like real estate, why they want to invest in real estate, why they want exposure to real estate, why they want tax advantages of real estate, et cetera, et cetera, the more that they're going to be apt to say, yes, let's do a deal together. Okay. Now, after you kind of talked about the generalities, you can start to talk about the deal. Right. But remember, this isn't a real deal. You're not talking about the deal that you have under contract, or maybe you don't have a deal under contract. Best is to start this process before you have something under contract. In fact, that's imperative. But you talk with them and you say, Look, I don't have a deal right now. They're going to breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. Thank God this guy's not about to hard sell me, pitch me, and make me try to wire him a hundred grand this week. Thank God. Pressure's off. Okay, don't worry. I, I don't have anything right now. I'm not here to hard pitch you on anything. I just wanted to start the conversation so that when I do have something, you're kind of educated about it and you know how we work and what this looks like. Is that fair? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, here's kind of the bones of a deal that I would do, right? This is not a real deal. This is a deal that we already closed or this is a deal that we had under contract, but it didn't work out because the seller wanted too much or whatever. But you have your example. And you go through it and you say, well, so this was a deal. It was $2 million was the purchase price. We were raising 500 grand on it. And this is why I thought it was a good deal because the rents were low and there was a value add and it only needed $200,000 in renovation and stabilized. It was going to be worth three and a half million and it cash flowed or whatever the good points of your sample deal are. And they need to be realistic, right? Because he's going to compare your future deal to the sample deal. But this would have generated a 15% per year return to the investor. And this is how the investor is going to get paid. That's very important, right? How the investor is going to get paid. Before I get ahead of myself, when you're talking about the specifics, you need to think about it this way. How do I protect my downside? That's what an investor's thinking. How do I get my money back? You know, and then what's in it for me? And then, you know, returns. Okay. Most people lead with returns. Oh my gosh, this is going to make 25% returns. This is a, such a great deal. How could you say no? And you know what the investor's thinking? Well, I don't give a crap about 25% returns if I lose 100% of my invested capital. You can tell me anything you want about my returns and how phenomenal they're going to be. You know, case in point, the podcast. I mean, the, the performance, was like, we're going to scale this thing to $100 million in five years. Okay, cool. Great. I hope you do. But that's not enough of a protection of my downside, right? I'm just thinking about, am I going to lose my 500 grand, right? So when you skip over that and you go straight to how phenomenal this business is and how phenomenal this deal is and how much money they're going to make and how much returns they're going to get, and this is just going to be gravy train, like that's going to lose, right? That's going to lose you investors. So you want to start with the protection of capital, right? This is why I like this. This is the built-in equity. We're going to be cash flow positive day one. This is our debt service coverage ratio. This is how we're protecting ourselves. This is how much cash we have to pay the mortgage. This is how much capital is going to be allowed to you know, be free cash that's going to get distributed to the investors. But this is a solid deal. It's a growing market, et cetera, et cetera. It needs to be where they can see, okay, 
reasonably my capital is protected and they have fail safes in place to either refinance or sell above our cost basis to get the capital back if the you know shit hits the fan okay pardon my french so that's first and foremost talking about the safety and the security of the deal okay then you're going to move into what's in it for me what's in it for them right what's in it for the investor well the investor gets X, lay that out. Like, here's the capital input. This is the hold. This is when we hope to refinance it. This is when we hope to sell. This is the cash flow. This is the chunk of money. Like, if you put in 100 grand, you're going to make, you know, $600 a month in passive cash flow. And then at sale, you're going to get your 100,000 back. Plus, you're going to get 30 grand or whatever that figure is. So that they can really quantify if I risk 100 grand, what am I going to get in return? They're also going to know, like, what's in it for you? What, what are you getting out of it? Here's how I get paid. I'm going to get an acquisition fee at closing of 2%. We're going to get this much of the cash flow after the preferred return. We're going to get this much of the equity at sale, et cetera, et cetera. This is how I'm getting paid. This is why I'm incentivized to do it. All right. It's important for them to see that and for that to seem fair and equitable to them. And then you're going into the returns. So, you know, if you're putting in a hundred grand and over the course of three years, you're making, you know, $50,000, you're making whatever that is, 12, 15% per year. Okay. So they can see that easily broken down of how they're going to make their money and what the returns are. And like I said, I cannot dictate this enough. That piece of the equation, it is important, but it is not nearly as important as people think it is. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Money markets, T-bills, backed by the United States federal government. What do they pay right now? If you follow that stuff, they pay, you know, five, five and a half percent, which is, I mean, that's decent. That's great. It's better than it's been in the last decade or 20 years, but still it's not a crazy return, right? If you pitch somebody on 5% returns, like you're you're not going to be raising any money for that deal. So why do people put millions and billions of dollars into T-bills and money market accounts? Well, because it's safe. It's perceived to be safe and it is, it is safe. I'm going to go out there and say it. It's, It's pretty dang safe right? It's liquid. They can go in and get their money out. If it's a T-bill within three months, if it's a money market within two days, they can get their money back out, right? And it's backed by the FDIC. It's backed by the federal government. It's going to not be lost. And so because the risk level is so low, they're willing to accept a lower return, okay? So your returns are higher but you have to show them that asymmetrical return to risk. So if it's a super high risk deal and the returns are really high, who cares, right? I mean, you can literally go to Las Vegas, put down $100,000 on one number, like red 31 or whatever. I don't really play roulette, so I don't know, but red 31, but there's a 31 out of 32 chance you're gonna lose 100% of capital. But if you hit that 100,000, man, that could turn into 3.2 million. Man, look at the returns on that. Is that attractive to you? I hope not, because you have a 31 out of 32 chance of losing all of your capital. So who's going to do that? Right? I mean, a psycho gambler, maybe, but most people are not going to go put 100 grand down on one number on the roulette wheel. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand that you have to show this is a low mitigated risk with outsized returns. That is the magic equation. That's what you need. That's why you got to focus on the risk first. Because if you just focus on, look, 32,000% return, but a 99.8%, 100% loss of capital, you're not going to get any investors. Okay, I'm not going to beat that dead horse. But these, this is how to do it, how to get started, right? So if you just had, let's say we're going back to our list, 100 people, narrowed it down to 20. You've got those meetings. 10 of them say yes. There's a million dollars right there. There's a million dollars that you have, you know, you don't have it in your bank, but you've got soft committed. That's going to give you comfort and authority and confidence when somebody comes to you with an opportunity. Because now you know, well, I've got these 10 people and I would say probably at least two or three or four of them are going to say yes to something. Okay. Now I'm going to get into the advanced strategies, advanced tactics, raising more than just a million dollars. This is where you got to do a little bit more work, but how do you do that? I mean, one is telling people what you're doing. You can do this through email. 
Email is very, very powerful. As you build your email list, you can go to Aweber or Constant Contact. I mean, there's a million different email portals out there, but you start writing a newsletter or you, you write something once a week. In the deal room, we have this program. It's called Social Media Secrets. It's an ebook that I wrote and it lays out how I raised literally $7 million from Facebook and email that people, people who never even met me. So don't think that this doesn't work and I'm only going to be able to raise capital from someone that's known me for 20 years. In fact, it's easier a lot of times to raise capital from people that haven't known you for 20 years. I don't know why that is, but it's the case. I mean, I just yesterday, I texted a guy who I've never met in person. He's invested with me a couple of times and you know he's a doctor. And I'm like, hey, I got a hard money loan. It's a great deal. You want to participate? And he just said, yeah, I'm in for a hundred grand. Boom. I mean, that was it. I didn't talk to him on the phone. I didn't do anything other than that text. Now, I had a track record with the guy, but he was in for a hundred grand. He doesn't know me outside of social media, outside of email, outside of my presence online. So it does work. And this is how you continue to scale outside of your own friends and family and the people that are in your phone and on your, on your Facebook list. Facebook groups, positioning yourself as an authority, creating a group, putting out content and saying, like, I'm the guy, I'm the money guy, I'm the multifamily guy. I, this is my area of expertise and putting yourself out there, letting the world know what you do. The more people that know what you do, the more people that can help you. Do you think you would make more money or less money if you had 100,000 followers online? Everybody's going to say, yeah, I'd probably be making more money because I have more opportunity. I have more people that I could help and more people that could help me. And so the only way to get 100,000 is to start with 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 and grow it from there. Social media is super powerful. You can post case studies, right? Let's say you've done a deal, even if it's just a rental home that you bought on your own. Hey, we bought this for X. We rented it for X. We refinanced out X. We sold it for X. You're showing people you are proficient. You are competent. You know what you're doing. Let's say you minority partnered on a 24 unit apartment complex because you, you pitched in a hundred grand as a limited partner. You can tell that story. This is where we were at. This was our rent rolls when we started. This is where we are now. This is where we're marching forward. We're going to refinance in March of 2025. And we're going to project to cash out 300 grand, Wh whatever it is, telling those stories online, stories sell, showing them case studies and becoming the go-to expert, the connection into this world. People want to invest in real estate. People want to invest in hard money loans. People want to make yield on their money in a safe manner. If you can become the conduit, the connector to that world, you can make money for yourself, you can carve off equity and deals for yourself, and you can propel your life. So guys, I know this was a little bit long episode. If it was helpful to you, share the show. Text the link to your friend, help spread the word, give me a five-star review, shoot me a DM. I appreciate each and every one of you listening to this. I want you to take some time this week to unlock your life. Peace. This is the podcastfactory.com. 